strap in, my friends, because we're about to blast off into a week packed with more terrific scenes than you would believe, every single one amazing in their own way. SpaceX alone has been off the charts in so many ways, with some incredible firsts right here. Then, where on earth did this concept come from? As is now the norm, there is marvellous engineering happening by the day. It's almost impossible to keep track of it all, but as always, we blend it together for you into a smooth, digestible paste and serve it right up every weekend. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Hey hey, Marcus House with you here. You know what I think is just terrific? Every week we are flooded with a torrent of great new Starship updates to dive into. Let's just kick off first at the Gateway to Mars launch site because this is a bit of an interesting one. No, it's got nothing to do with the huge orbital tank farm just yet, but over here at the suborbital tank farm. Almost a week ago on Sunday they hooked this crane up to a small suborbital tank, and before we knew it, it was up in the air, moved over, and placed onto a self-propelled modular transport. It rolled past Lab Padre's cameras as it left the site. Was this the start of the suborbital tank farm removal? Well, no actually, it doesn't seem so, because weirdly, an existing tank in the farm was attached to the crane, and then moved over to fill the exact same spot held by that removed tank. A tank replacement at the suborbital side seems quite out of the blue, doesn't it? And this certainly does point towards the suborbital pad area remaining in action for a while to come. We do, of course, still expect all static fires of the upper stage ships to eventually happen at the developing Massey's test site. That is because there is a big benefit to being able to free up the launch site from the continual runs of pressure, cryogenic, and static fire testing. Moving slightly over the site, the LR11000 crane that was dismantled last week has been getting reassembled again. The theory around why they've done this relates to SpaceX using the crane for so long here that it was probably well overdue for a good thorough check over. Being right on the coast, extra corrosion due to the salt water nearby can really take its toll quickly, so yeah, glad we're seeing this crane getting back into action. At the orbital side, both the booster and the ship quick disconnects were quite active this week. Here was the one for the booster doing a quick retraction test, but in this case it was exactly the same time as the ship quick disconnect did its test above. That to me looks like a simultaneous retraction test there in preparation for the Flight 3 vehicles to arrive at the pad, hopefully in the next few weeks. There is fun build work going on as well at the Starbase site. Last week we left you with Ship 28 popping its head out of the high bay. It looked like it was going to roll out at the time, but for some reason had just turned and went back into the bay. There were some final touches needed before rolling out, such as installing heat tiles over the old nose cone hooks. Regardless, we were soon finally up for transport with Ship 28 indeed rolling out to be parked in the ring yard. It remained here for a while before being finally transported down to the Sanchez area of the site, ending up being stored in the rocket garden. Right next to that, the odd flapless and shieldless Ship 26. Weirdly, that had once again been lifted off the engine installation stand and moved over to the transport stand nearby. That ship was disconnected from the crane and moved away into a parking spot. Now, that crane then picked up a newer two-point lifter that we've seen used previously in Mega Bay 2. These are great because they can use the same two lift points under the forward flaps that the tower arms use. In the future, there will be absolutely no need to install all of the old style nose cone hooks which need to be removed eventually and in some places carefully tiled over. Anyway, that was attached to Ship 28 and it was then raised over the top of the ship processing stand that Ship 28 had just left. Having this next ship to fly on the work stand saves space in the high bay, which also allows another ship to begin its build. Midweek, Starship Gazer did though catch a sea level raptor being removed from Ship 28. It is a little odd that they hadn't done this a lot earlier, so I wonder why they chose to do this now. Perhaps it's something as simple as some new debris being found inside the engine after all of this upgrade work has taken place. The big question, I guess, is whether they're now going to need to do another static fire. While we are talking about engine movements, a couple of new engines were moved into Mega Bay 2 where Ship 29 currently resides. A sea level engine was taken out first, a replacement one was moved in, as well as another new Raptor as well. So yeah, hopefully that means that we'll soon be seeing a static fire test with Ship 29 as well. 
So yes, apart from that, Raptor work on Ship 28, the one and only ship designated to fly with Integrated Flight Test 3, it seems so close to being rolled out to the launch site now. Remember, this flight is predicted to occur sometime this very month. Still no word yet on the mishap report, but if that date does stick, we are going to be seeing it very soon. Exciting times ahead. What is it that you are most looking forward to for Flight 3? Let me know. Now this here is a story with a few pros and cons. Always great to talk about new developments, but some are not so good for those of us observing from the outside. Yes, for the last couple of weeks we began to see things such as these new rails installed in the doorway of both of the mega bays. It seemed pretty clear that we were seeing the beginning of some sort of ginormous door. That was indeed confirmed this week, as this door part was lifted up to the very top of the frame on the first mega bay. So why, after all this time, install a door now? Well, ever since this taller bay was constructed, numerous stacking attempts have been aborted due to high winds. After all, you don't want any precious space hardware swaying around and knocking into another. This was such a concern that SpaceX even added these weather stations to measure wind speed. Obviously, adding a door that could block that wind would remove the problem. Starship Gazer caught these photos of the initial stage being completed, and you can just see that it seems to be a sturdy sheet there that can fold or roll up. You will notice that it isn't perfectly sealed off here, but this will still provide loads of cover against the wind. Later in the week, that was extended further to around the middle of the doorway, and fully extended down to the bottom by the end of the week. Sadly, this does mean that we're going to lose more views of the build work from time to time. However, SpaceX have just kind of done that some justice as they posted these three amazing photos inside the mega bay. There are technically four boosters here. Booster 10 on the left, 12 in the middle, and 11 on the right. Then we have Booster 13's liquid oxygen tank on the very far left here, and the methane tank on the other side. These photos just seem like works of art. Now, this is a fun one. Down at Kennedy Space Center, a new tower section was spotted on NASA spaceflight's cameras, moving to the water turn basin. From there, equipment like this can be loaded onto barges for transport, as we've seen a number of times now, but this new tower segment is one of the full-sized sections. The other one that had arrived at the port of Brownsville from Florida a few weeks ago was actually a shorter section. Another three full-sized sections turned up at the basin a day later, so the Tower 3 program seems to be well underway now. But where are all of these sections coming from? Yes, indeed they are of course coming from SpaceX's Roberts Road facility in Florida. NASA Spaceflight picked up some great new updates from their latest flight here too. Take a look behind the Falcon 9 hangar there, and we can see that the many Starship Tower sections sitting here have had a bunch of work done on them recently. These were getting constructed before October of 2022, as shown in this flight video at the time by Greg Scott. Along with this, here are the chopsticks that have seen relatively little action over the past few months, but if we zoom in, you can see that there is new scaffolding that has been set up near them. This is a great sign that some serious work is going on to prepare these for transport too. We are definitely getting close to seeing the two towers stage of the Starship program, but we still don't have any clues as to where that will be built. A big thank you to Greg Scott and NASA Spaceflight for continually updating us so frequently with the Roberts Road facility updates from the past few years. It has been so critical in making sense of the bigger picture, so if you can give them a helping hand, that is amazing of you. Greg has a Patreon link that I've got in the description, and NASA Spaceflight, well, you can support in many ways over their various platforms. Without these awesome teams around the sites, none of these videos would be here either. Everything is community built, and you make that happen for all of us. So thanks a bunch for being here, being subscribed. I'm absolutely grateful to each and every one of you. Now, one of the more exciting Starship-related updates during the week was this announcement by SpaceX about Starlab, a joint venture of Voyager Space and Airbus Space. Amazingly, they have designed this sweet Starlab space station to be launched on a single flight. Due to the massive 9 metre wide diameter of Starship, there is currently no other vehicle that could even attempt this, so yeah, it's so cool. The station here will have a large hab with a laboratory module, and then attached to that will be the service module with engines along with the power supply. The entire thing is 8 metres in diameter, with the main height of that hab area also being 8 metres long, so even within Starship, it's going to be a tight squeeze. Now, there are some big names attached to this project, so it isn't just some pipe dream. This is a true next generation space station. No assembly is needed at all, the entire thing is just deployed. 
At that point, the docking node will allow vehicles to dock with it, and it even has a robotic arm for anything that needs berthing. The great thing is, I think, is that as a single deployable unit, imagine that these could perhaps be mass produced with a string of them set up for the future. Some for labs, and some for tourism. As SpaceX posted, Starship will fundamentally change how we access space, with entire space stations like Starlab launching on a single mission. Now, the big Starship question that I have, I guess, is will we finally now start to see a big math version of Starship like these old renders, simply to be able to deploy such a thing? How will something that massive get released? Hopefully, we'll know soon. Now, the story of the week, in my opinion, was this amazing first for SpaceX. Northrop Grumman's Cygnus resupply vehicle for the International Space Station was launched for the first time on a Falcon 9. This was the NG-20 Cygnus mission, launching from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral. A very clear, scenic, and beautiful liftoff there of Booster 1077, I must say. The always incredible Greg Scott was back out there, snapping a couple of beauties on this mission as well. I really loved this longer exposure shot, actually. Looks like a giant lightsaber, doesn't it? Now, as you may be aware, all the existing Northrop Grumman's Antares line of rockets were retired. You may remember the Antares 230 Plus rocket flew on its final mission back in August last year, taking the NG-19 Cygnus spacecraft to the ISS. With the next generation Antares 330 still in development, they had an obvious new way to launch this new resupply mission. Though they have launched Cygnus on Atlas V a couple of times in the past, United Launch Alliance aren't selling these anymore because they're transitioning to the new Vulcan Centaur. That made this obvious choice clear, the Falcon 9. That, by the way, means that during this transition, SpaceX is now the only rocket launching missions to the International Space Station from the USA, period. That is a crazy Crazy thought, and it sure has plenty of capability to do this too, no problem. Along with the stage separation here, revealing the shorter Merlin vacuum nozzle used, which is cheaper and less efficient than the normal one, they also made this a return to launch site mission, so it didn't even need a drone ship for this one. I think it's also worth noting that this is also the first time that a cargo capsule of any sort other than Dragon was launched with Falcon 9. Due to this, they actually had to make a few adjustments to support Cygnus. Unlike the typical Dragon capsule, which doesn't need fairings at all, this Cygnus spacecraft here is encapsulated between the fairings. The problem is, the cargo management team needs to load some supplies and experiments in the few hours before launch. To allow this, SpaceX actually had to build a special 5 by 4 foot door into the fairing, along with installing a mobile clean room. The load time sensitive cargo was loaded as late as possible while the rocket was still laying down, and that went vertical just 7 hours before launch. Sadly, there were no views shared of that process, which is a little disappointing because it's quite interesting. I think this here is probably Probably the door based on a little feedback, but that is still a little speculative. A beautiful fairing separation here of it, a sight never quite seen before, and it was then time for an incredible SpaceX landing shot. The booster just brilliantly made its way down to land back at the launch site. A big shout out to NASA and SpaceX's camera operators tracking it beautifully all the way down. Given that this was a NASA mission, it was quite lucky because they streamed it in much higher quality than we are typically getting now with SpaceX's Twitter broadcasts. And bam, that is the 10th successful landing there for Booster 1077. Soon after, up there in orbit, the second stage deployed the Cygnus spacecraft, which began its 40-hour journey to the International Space Station. When it arrived, it was all up to Jasmine and Laurel controlling the cannon arm to grab hold of it, and then berth it to the station's Unity module. Now, this was actually only originally planned to stay here for about four months, but this has been extended now to six to allow for more trash to be stowed inside for when it is sent back into Earth's atmosphere to burn up sometime around July. Now, they also also mentioned that it may also be used for a potential reboost of the ISS, which is always exciting. It's going to depend, I guess, on how much propellant is left. So yes, after all of this, the important thing is that Cygnus has now successfully delivered almost four tons of cargo. There's loads of consumable supplies as always, but also lots of great experiments to do with robotic surgeries, 3D metal printing techniques, a study observing cell culture degeneration, observing a new semiconductor manufacturing method, and loads, loads more. This is going to be super exciting. 
Now, while on the topic of Falcon 9, there were also the two back-to-back -back Starlink launches early this week. These were only four hours apart and super similar looking, so we'll show them side by side and play spot the difference. First, Starlink Group 638 from the East Coast there on Falcon 9 Booster 1062, and on the right, the Starlink Group 712 mission launching from Vandenberg Space Force Base. This one, Booster 1075. SpaceX are certainly well on the way to being able to do the 150 50 launches for 2024, which I believe is still the goal. It is an incredible success story, I think. Starlink has grown so rapidly over the past few years, and it seems like almost every week there is some kind of story about the technology that grows around this network. The coverage here on the global map recently shared shows just how much that service has spread. As you can see, super popular over here in Australia and New Zealand as well. As a side note, I just love this animation here showing the latency difference between the network at around 550 kilometers in altitude versus a geostationary satellite. This is played at super slow-mo just to give you the idea. Speeding that up to real time, you can't even see the Starlink indicator anymore. It just turns into this blur at this point. Anyway, getting myself sidetracked again, aren't I? Back to these missions, we got to see two really great landings, Booster 1062 landing for the 18th time and the ninth landing for Booster 1075. Now, it has been a real roller coaster watching the events break from JAX's SLIM mission or the Smart Lander for Investigating Moon. I'll jump into that more in just a moment, but first, a massive thank you to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video. A virtual private network, or VPN, is a service that both hides your IP address and encrypts your data. As methods for phishing and cyber attack become more sophisticated, it is becoming more important to add an extra level of security to your online presence, and Surfshark is a perfect first port of call for this protection. Tired of pop-ups and potential malicious ads? Well, Surfshark's clean web feature will take care of that. Of course, a major benefit of a VPN is that you get to view all of the extra online content that would normally be geographically blocked from you. Maybe your favorite movie is not available in your country yet. Just fire up your VPN and you can sort that out right away. You just change the country you're accessing the internet from and the job is done. Refresh your browser and hey presto, you will now have a bunch of the selected region's content available to you. In fact, you'll be surprised by the amount of extra online features and social media platforms that may be accessible with this enabled. Another great feature is that just having this one subscription gives you unlimited use, so you can use Surfshark VPN across all of your devices simultaneously. Try it out with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Just go to surfshark.deals Marcus and use code Marcus to get three additional months for free. Thank you, Surfshark. So yes, JAX's SLIM mission hasn't been short on surprises. There is a new twist to this incredible story of this moon lander. Last weekend, when talking about this, the assumption was that the end had probably come for the lander given that it had landed nose down and hadn't received any useful solar charge due to those panels facing the wrong way. This here, by the way, was an awesome shot of it recently taken by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Just a few pixels from that distance, but what pixels they are! There was just a little hope left that as the sun passed well overhead, that the angle could still capture useful power. A final chance, maybe, to charge the batteries before lunar night kicked in. In a way, it is actually really lucky that it landed nose down and not flipped all the way over onto its back because, believe it or not, the solar panels did indeed start receiving sunlight. And to our surprise, Slim actually woke up early this week. JAXA reconnected with it and they wasted no time. They needed to urgently rip back into anything they could do with the super valuable and limited time that they had left. The multi-band camera observations were underway and given that, the instrument had successfully obtained first flight. Now, they have nicknamed many of the rocks in view here with these dog names, which I think did confuse some people initially. This was the view of Toy Poodle as one shared example. So yes, they've literally only had a few days of useful solar power before the sun finally set on Shioli Crater later this week. Similar to ISRO's Chandrayaan-3, this lander doesn't have technology on board to survive the two-week-long lunar night. So the big question is, is it going to reawaken for more fun, or is this indeed the final end for Slim? So we were dealt another good hand midweek because Rocket Lab kicked off their first mission of 2024 from New Zealand. This one is named Four of a Kind, and I really love the patch design on this mission. A bit of wordplay there on the name of a poker hand. Now, that of course represented the four satellites for Spire Global and its customer North Star 
Earth and space. These satellites are for space situational awareness and will simultaneously monitor near Earth objects from their 530 km sun synchronous orbit, essentially to assist in tracking and collision avoidance. But the software to do that is really quite amazing. It is watching the sky, spotting streaks of light from cameras, and then converting those 2D images into a 3D model of the orbit for each found object. They stated here that this could be accurate within just meters instead of kilometers. It is worth a listen to if you really love the technology behind that, so a link to this is in the description. Now this was also an exciting recovery mission attempt for the Electron Booster, with the ship already waiting on target prior to launch. Of course, the liftoff itself was spectacular as always there from the picturesque pad. A little cloudier than usual, but still a wonderful camera feed right through. Check out the fairing separation shot right here. It is really great to see these views on the Electron missions now. And similar to Falcon 9 coverage, we were watching live cameras on both the second stage and the first stage heading in for re-entry. Also love the trajectory readouts here. They've put a lot of efforts into these streams. Battery hot swap there as the first stage fell back past the 80 kilometer mark. We got some really great footage of the beginnings of the violent re-entry. The booster was holding up fine before the signal dropped out. Just seconds later, there were the drogue chutes and we were back with the booster looking upward. Shortly after, the main chutes were out and after the 17 minute mark, splash down there. That was just beautiful. Another 17 minutes and we had these shots live as well. The recovery vessel passing by Electron right there, looking beautifully intact. Quite soon after, the deployment of the satellites from the kick stage was confirmed. And that, my friends, was a wrap of a pretty darn amazing mission. The hope, of course, is that Rocket Lab can soon refly a full Electron rocket instead of individual components. But they'll need to fully check this one out and run various tests to see if they've nailed the design. They did publish some nice shots of this one just before flight, actually, to help protect against the re-entry forces. They have the silver heat protection, along with the extended carbon composite shield to protect those Rutherford engines. Speaking of the engines, there were no reused engines flying on this mission, contrary to a few comments that I've been seeing around. They've done that before in 2023, but not again for this mission. Finally, there was the Electron on board. An absolutely beautiful mission, this one. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to hit subscribe so we get to keep making them. Thanks for watching all this way through. That helps a heap. I'll see you all in the next video.